Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. and welcome to the new episode of Masters of Carpentry, a uh, podcast dedicated to the filmography of John Carpenter, one of my favorite directors, and I believe one of Noel's as well. Possibly. Possibly. He's a director that you enjoy. <laughs> I like Kurosawa maybe just a little more. Oh, yeah. Well, come on. That's Kurosawa. That's amazing. And Julia has a passing fancy, Julia. <laughs> I think I'm, I guess, the outsider opinion. The outsider opinion. The yeah. wild card, if you will. That's right. The girl. <laughs> um, the fecta of our trifecta. That's exactly. right. Exactly. I shall be the cherry. <laughs> On a Sunday. <laughs> yeah, so we're doing Dark Star today. This is the first film film. I believe it originally started as a student project. I think we learned in the last episode. Well, I've got a little history on that. In fact, if I can actually backtrack a little bit, the Blu-ray had a great documentary on the making of this film where they even went back and talked about Resurrection of Bronco Billy a bit. Ooh. And one of the problems with Resurrection of Bronco Billy was that they only credited the one director, and that one director was the only one who got to go and collect an Oscar. So John Carpenter, you know, was a little bitter about that. He felt it wasn't equally credited and all that stuff. And he was also becoming increasingly disillusioned with the whole USC student film project because you don't own your films. You're essentially making things for the school to own and to show and profit off of. Anyways, while he was still there, he wanted to do one more film about space truckers. <laughs> And he ran into another one who was kind of notorious for being a very, how do I want to say, eccentric and outspoken student named Dan O'Bannon. And this film is kind of a collection of both of their ideas. Dan O'Bannon, of course, co-wrote the movie. He edited the movie. He was the production designer. He was the special effects supervisor. And he plays Pinback. So he's in half the movie. Oh, very cool. It started as a 20-minute short. But then it blew up to 35 minutes, and then it blew up to 45 minutes. And by that point, they were told by USC that it wouldn't screen in any of their festivals because you have a half-hour maximum requirement. So they actually stole the material from USC. <laughs> they literally just snuck into the archives, took the film that was already shot. They just ran away with the film and tried to do it on their own. They got it up to 60 minutes. And this was all over the course of like four years. There were like four different periods of shooting. And they ran out of money and brought it to Jack H. Harris, who was a film distributor for a few decades, who then went and made his own movie with The Blob. Oh. And that was kind of like his one big thing that he just kept bringing around to theaters for like 15 years. And so he funded the remainder of the shoot. And it came out, and sadly, though, they brought it to the same distributor who distributed Deep Throat, which was a mafia-controlled distributor who not only tied up all the rights, but collected all the profits and didn't share any. Well, I mean, I guess when you work with the mafia, you got to expect a little of that. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a film that neither Dan O'Bannon nor John Carpenter have a whole lot of fondness for, even though it was kind of what started them. It does seem like a collection of ideas and scenes more than a cohesive film. And in fact, when they did the last chunk of shooting, that's why there's so much pinback in the movie played by Dan O'Bannon, because he was the only actor still on set because he was making the movie. I was going to say that I thought that all the padding came from pinback versus the beach ball. And that's why they still had 20 minutes of movie left to add, and he was kind of the only actor available. That makes a lot of sense then, yeah. yeah. It seemed to be like a dynamite short, which was padded with a bunch of slapstick that went nowhere. Just to get into some of the other people involved in the film, Dan O'Bannon, of course, after this went on and actually through this film, George Lucas, who was, you know, the, the most famous USC alumni, actually saw this film. And a lot of the people who worked on the special effects department here got jobs working on Star Wars, Wow! including Dan O'Bannon, who did every single computer monitor and computer display in Star Wars. And he was also then involved in a version of Dune that never got made, where he was supposed to be the special effects supervisor. Ridley Scott was working on that, and also working on that were the artist Jean-Gerard Mobius, who Dan O'Bannon worked on with a number of projects, and H.R. Giger. 
all three of these people then came with him to work on Alien, which was kind of his most famous work. And with Alien, he met Ron Chusset, with whom he'd go wrote Total Recall. Then he went off and did the films Blue Thunder, Life Force, Invaders from Mars, made his directorial debut with Return of the Living Dead. But then in the second half of the 80s and throughout the 90s, he was someone who got sick a lot and spent the majority of the 90s hospitalized. He had Crohn's disease, but it wasn't diagnosed until almost you know, like 98, 99. That's eventually what killed him in 2009. So he kind of like started having this great cult career and then just was physically unable to keep maintaining it. That's really sad. Yeah. And I love Return of the Living Dead. I love Blue Thunder. I love, I, I love Dan O'Bannon stuff. I have a great affection for Return of the Living Dead as well. It's good stuff. I have not seen any of the others that you mentioned. He also did a number of uh, little short pieces for Heavy Metal Magazine, some of which were adapted into the movie. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Mobius has connections with heavy metal as well, I believe. Yeah, in fact, one of them was a short that the two of them did together that Dan O'Bannon wrote and he drew. That's really cool. Have you seen Heavy Metal, the movie? Yes, I have. Not for a long time, but I have. You know the opening scene where it's an astronaut in a Cadillac dropping through the atmosphere? I don't remember that, actually. That was a two-page strip that he did. Very cool. And it was actually kind of a play on the guy who surfs through the atmosphere in this movie. I could see that, yeah. So also on the crew, we had Nick Castle, who was the assistant cameraman, as well as playing the alien beach ball. <laughs> we mentioned Nick Castle in our last episode. He works on a number of other Carpenter films. He went on to do Last Starfighter and a number of other things. Tommy Lee Wallace, who also we will hear, he was also the art director on this movie. Ron Cobb, the production designer, was a popular sci-fi artist and cartoonist at the time. O'Bannon brought him into Alien, where he won an Oscar. Then, throughout the 80s, Ron Cobb worked on Conan, Aliens, Last Starfighter, Abyss, Total Recall, and more recently did the ship designs for Firefly. So basically everything I grew up on, so that's cool. <laughs> exactly. Jane Stein Kaplan, the associate producer and assistant director. He was also the producer on Assault on Precinct 13. Douglas Knapp, the cinematographer, was also the cinematographer on Assault on Precinct 13. He typically works more as a camera operator, though, which he did on Escape from New York. And he actually was the chief camera operator through the entirety of Star Trek Voyager and Star Trek Enterprise. Oh, very cool. And he actually, during this shoot, got a job on Terrence Malick's famous film Badlands in the camera department and actually left Badlands so he could come back and keep shooting Dark Star. That's quite the choice, but I, I admire that. And his wife, Cookie, was the voice of the computer. Awesome. Cookie? Yeah. It's adorable. <laughs> And then uh, finally, we have Bill Taylor, one of the special effects technicians. He did matte works on dozens of films throughout the 80s, including The Thing, and is a digital effects supervisor who does dozens and dozens of film and TV things today. He has cameo appearances in both Assault on Precinct 13 and The Fog, and he wrote the song Benson, Arizona. Oh, that's awesome. I was actually wondering about that. I wasn't sure if that was like an original song or that they created. It, it was an original song that him and John Carpenter put together. Very cool. I was going to talk about the music and stuff because it seems like it started to get into the Carpenter territory of score with the synths and whatnot. Oh, yeah. A lot of mood. Yes, a lot of mood. And, of course, a little bit of country. Moving out of country mm -hmm. into synths. Oh, yeah. And, of course, you know, the idea was to be space truckers. And what would a trucker listen to on a long haul? Exactly. This was also supposed to be kind of the start of a series of collaborations between John Carpenter and Dan O'Bannon, where they would co-write a bunch of films and Carpenter would direct one, then O'Bannon would direct one, and they'd go back and forth. But by the end of the film, they pretty much stopped talking to each other. And in fact, John Carpenter has never even really done any, you know, John Carpenter does special features for all of his movies. He has kind of avoided Dark Star because it's such a Dan O'Bannon movie, too. Oh, wow. The current Blu-ray that's like loaded with features, the only interviews it has with Carpenter are from like the early 80s. That's really sad. This is like an apocalypse now of science fiction films. <laughs> Everyone yeah. done each other. So why don't we just talk about, you know, what were each of our personal histories with this movie? Who would like to go first? I'll go first. I just spoke for five minutes. I'll let you guys have to. <laughs> All right, Julia, you go first. I have no, no history whatsoever. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Never heard of it before? No. Up until now? No. Okay. Not Never okay. passed you by? At no. uh, the video store? It didn't. No, I'm sorry. All right. I believe I mentioned last time I heard about it through the band. So I tracked it down at a video store that had carried VHS. Band? So, uh, Pinback. Is that what they're named after? That's what they're named ask. after, yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
So the indie rock band Pinback is named after Lieutenant Pinback. And Lincoln did they name the ship, did they name that after Star Wars, or was Star Wars named after it? What do you mean, Dark Star? Yeah. I don't think there's a ship called Dark Star. Anymore. You're thinking of the Death Star. Right. Yeah, the Death Star. But it does the same thing, right? It blows up planets? It does, in fact, blow up planets, but I don't know for sure. Well, but... you know, I mean, a chunk of this crew did end up working on Star Wars, so you <laughs> never know. Yes. In the early drafts of the script, it was just called the Space Fortress. Yeah, so basically I rented it. Uh, it was one of those films I watched late at night, and I thought it was super trippy and really cool, with the exception of a few parts that really dragged, which we'll get into. And yeah, the rest is history. Here I am again with my new thoughts as an adult on it. <laughs> <laughs> no? This is one that I saw somewhere in the early to mid-90s when my dad was kind of exposing me to John Carpenter films, because I remember this film actually was kind of unavailable, but then there was the big VHS release. So that was my first time seeing it, and I had picked it up on DVD, but I'd never watched it. I'm kind of glad I hadn't, because that DVD for a while was uh, Dan O'Bannon went back and just brought it back to the old 60-minute cut before they added the last 20 minutes of footage. Eh, I, I like that extra 20 minutes of footage. We'll get into it. Mm -hmm. You know, watching a couple of months ago here on Blu-ray, which you wouldn't expect this film to clean up well on Blu-ray, but wow, they really remastered it beautifully. It's my first time watching it since the uh, early to mid-90s. Yes, we rented a copy and it looks really good. I was a little worried at first that it would be like Superman 4 and just <laughs> show all the bad stuff. Like in Superman 4, you could see space kind of flapping in the breeze because it's a set mm -hmm. and it's like a curtain. But no, it looked really good. What surprised me was how much I remembered about it. How much of it actually stuck with me from when I saw it like 20 years ago. I remember the ending like it was yesterday. So that really stuck with me. And most of the scenes as well, even pinned back in the halls and whatnot. So yeah, for sure. I even remember the whole bit where their storage locker blew up, taking their entire supply of toilet paper. <laughs> Did you remember that? Because I've already forgotten that twice <laughs> yeah. now. So <laughs> that yeah. disappeared out of my He mind. does it in one of his like, video diary entry. Yeah. Like, okay. He talks about it happening. I think I just blanked out there. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. So yeah, so that's my memory of the film. And uh, do we want to move into the synopsis? All right, let's do the synopsis. The Dark Star is a deep space vessel on a 20-year mission to seek out unstable planets and stars and destroy them with nuclear bombs so as to clear the way for colony ships. The crew currently consists of the eagerly whining Pinback, the bullying and macho Boiler, the detached Talby who spends all his time on the observation deck staring at stars, and the bitter and burned out Doolittle, who was forced to take command when the ship's captain was killed by a faulty wire beneath his chair. After unleashing bomb number 19, the crew has one explosive left before they can head back to a home they barely remember. So that's of course when they run into an asteroid storm which damages their computer and the bomb's communication laser. They don't notice this for a while because Pinback is chasing his pet alien beach ball around the ship, Boiler gets his rocks off shooting at pieces of scrap metal with a laser, Doolittle pecks at a makeshift organ he's assembled and dreams of being able to surf once again, and Talby keeps staring at stars. As they approach their final bomb run, Talby is finally investigating the damaged laser, but the crew ignores him and the bomb is armed. It doesn't launch when it's supposed to and is a bit pissy at the whole situation, thus refusing to shut down. So with the clock ticking, Doolittle gets some advice from the dead captain, exits the ship, and has a philosophical conversation with the bomb, where he teaches it phenomenology and that the data it receives can't always be relied upon as accurate. This convinces the bomb to retract, but then it goes off anyway killing Pinback and Boiler and leaving Talby and Doolittle adrift in their spacesuits. Talby is pulled into the passing Phoenix asteroids, where he'll circle the cosmos for untold millennia. As Doolittle approaches a planet's atmosphere, he snags a piece of wreckage and gets in one last surf as he burns into a shooting star. So, do you guys recommend this movie? I do. I enjoyed it immensely. Oh, it's hard with this movie, because there are passages where I wasn't entirely enthralled with the movie, and I kind of spaced out. But overall, yes, I would recommend this movie. It is funny. It's interesting. Yeah, it's just a really good flick. Julia? Yes. Yes, I would. I was very surprised, too. I didn't think I would like it at all. When you I described was... it to me, I was like, oh, great. <laughs> I was a little worried. <laughs> yeah, all right. We'll watch it. We'll see what happens. But honestly, I was about as close to being as enthralled as you can be. I really liked the tone. I really liked... Actually, I really liked everything about it, which is a wonderful surprise, actually. And I would highly recommend it. I really enjoyed it. Lovely to hear. Noel? I also recommend the film. It does have some pacing issues, but it's just so inventive that it more than makes up for its limitations in terms of budget and experience by just being a really creative, bizarre, and deadpan. I, I just, I, I love it. I, I, it I'm i trying to... that thing. 
trying to collect my He's words. Saying that people look for in actors to be stars, yes. that it factor, it has that feeling. That's what it gets across. It's like yes. a film. It's like a Little Miss Sunshine of little science fiction films. It's very peppy. Yes. I would use peppy to describe it. It's one of those films that you almost feel like it shouldn't work, and yet it does so magnificently that you feel bad for having doubted it. And true, I felt bad. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't think I was going to like it as much as I did the second time. And I was like, you know what? This is pretty sweet. Because <laughs> even when it does, like, you know, some cheap things, like the kind of cut and paste effects for the spaceships and, you know, the muffin tins on the spacesuit, it does so with a kind of acknowledging wink. And it also has this consistency to it that it has a cheapness to it, but it's consistently cheap. So it never feels out of place. <laughs> It was kind of a cheapness I found beautiful. It was like the old sets of Star Trek. I found mm -hmm. it like, even though it didn't have much money, there was a lot of attention put into it and a lot of like passion put into it. And it just like had this really beautiful look to it, like all the space and everything, all the nebulae and whatnot. <laughs> yeah. And it also just has a really clever script. Yes. It's this kind of really sad story about loneliness and guys who are just completely disconnected from each other and their job and the world they came from who are also, like, really silly assholes that we get to laugh at. <laughs> Which made the film a lot, like, if it was just them going crazy, I wouldn't appreciate it, but I like the fact that they were silly. Yeah, I didn't really understand it in the beginning. I'm like, how did these dudes become astronauts? Like, they're dudes. Yeah. They're surfing, <laughs> long-haired <laughs> dudes, and they're like, hey, man, let's do space. That's cool. Well, if you think about some of the original test pilots who became astronauts. That's well, true, Well, yeah. Pinback was explained because he's Pinback, not... Pinback, yeah. And I love that backstory for Pinback. Yeah. I love that no one listens to him when he <laughs> says it. Well, because he said it four years ago, didn't yeah. he? Oh, no, wait, it was four years ago. They only want to listen to that story once. I thought it was going to be difficult to tell everyone apart at first. I'm like, these guys all look like Tom Skerritt and Alien. <laughs> But I love that the real pinback like had a complete mental breakdown just before the mission and jumped in, in the vat of coolant fuel. Yes. <laughs> but I found after like I got used to the tone, mm -hmm. then I accepted them as they were. Yeah. It was fun. And I actually kind of like them. Uh, yeah, I did too. They're very relaxed as well as being crazy, which I appreciated because usually it's like space madness and everyone's like really on edge. But this was just kind of like a laid back crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it should be said that None of this cast really ever did anything before this or afterwards. Dan O'Bannon and the guy playing Doolittle were both directors who were just, you know, you help us out with my film, I'll help you out with your film. And the guys who played Talby and Boiler weren't even part of the film school. I don't know who Talby was. I know that he had a very heavy accent, so they had to dub over all of his lines. But the guy who played Boiler was actually in the law department and is now a judge. Nice. <laughs> So he's got that one film to look back on and show his buddies. Like the guy from uh, Troll 2? Yeah, the, the dentist from Troll 2. Yeah. They were way too relaxed to be actors, so I appreciated <laughs> that they weren't. <laughs> they really did capture this kind of burnout. It just seemed like they were having fun being there. But also, yeah, it did capture the burnout, the very malaise and kind of like, oh, whatever happens, happens. And let's all see who can epic outbeard one another. Yeah, there was a lot of beards. They looked like a Swedish metal band. It was pretty impressive. I love how even when they go into Captain Powell's ice chamber, he has a beard. That's true. A frozen uh, beard. Ice beard. Wouldn't that have been a great place for an Alan Moore cameo? I think so, yeah. What I love about the design of this film is that this could realistically happen in the same setting as like 2001. Absolutely. But this is the dirty underside that they don't talk about. Absolutely. It did have that kind of feel of the way the generation was going in like the films of the late 60s through the 70s, that kind of like burnout feel to it, like an easy rider in space. Mm -hmm. I like that. I mean, like I even love how it opens with this commander back on Earth just completely bullshitting them about how important their mission is. Yeah. Exactly. We mourned him for a week. Our <laughs> flags were half mast. And like that their last transmission was displayed on television and that it yeah. got very great ratings and reviews. <laughs> and then I love just little throwaway lines like, you know, they're telling us the signal is coming from farther away in a part of space we didn't think you were going to be. So they, they kind of know that these people are just going crazy and wandering around. <laughs> but I just love this entire concept of before we send out the colony ships, we're going to send out people with nuclear bombs to blow up any planets that will threaten the colony ships. I got to get it done. You're just clear cutting. Yeah. America, man. <laughs> <laughs> and I also love that the bombs, the nuclear bombs themselves, are actually kind of sentient. Yes, I like the sassy bombs a lot. <laughs> I love how bomb number 19 is really excited and eager to do his job. Mm -hmm. He's been waiting. Yeah. yeah. 
And then bomb number 20 is just get this fucking over with. I bet <laughs> you're, you've called me out twice. And it's it's just I, I love the malaise of the movie. It's true. It does give it that unique feel, that kind of laid back atmosphere of it. And like that, whatever, who cares? When they're basically playing God and destroying planets, but they just couldn't care less. <laughs> but then it's also just got this chipperness to it. Like, I love how the entire end sequence is literally like, our friends have died. Now let's die in whatever peaceful way we can. And but with a nice chipper return of Benson, Arizona. I think they were happy to die. <laughs> I think they were excited for a change of pace. Yeah. <laughs> And it seemed like a really good death, as he said, like becoming a shooting star. That seems pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And the one guy got to see his asteroids and uh, he was pretty happy. Yeah, I wonder if the final thing he never got to say before his radio cut off will be told in a Prometheus 2. <laughs> we can only hope. Because O'Bannon th did kind of jokingly loosely tie this universe into Alien so it could technically happen. I completely believe that. And since Ridley Scott wants to tie Alien into Blade Runner, we could technically have a Dark Star Blade Runner crossover where we find out they're all replicants. Oh, Ridley, what are you going to do next? Uh, I was down with whatever his ideas were until I saw Prometheus, and I'm like, maybe. Yeah. No. Well enough below. <laughs> yeah. Let's have our memories. So uh, one thing we should talk about that they did add that it was kind of a change of pace is all the pinback scenes where he basically spends 20 minutes of the film chasing a beach ball. Yes, which if it was anyone else but Pinback, I would have hated it. But since it was Pinback and the actor playing it did such a good job, it was very, I wouldn't say wonderful, but it was definitely better than it should have been. It was one of those things that on paper, it sounds really stupid, mm -hmm. but I actually really quite find it entertaining. The fact that it went on so long, it kept getting better. I also think because that was some of the last stuff they shot, over this four-year shoot, I think that's actually some of the most polished cinematography and editing they have in the movie. Probably. I mean, just those great shots of Pinback, like, marching down the corridor. and I love that shot where he's standing there looking for the alien, and the camera pans down, and it's right behind him and grabs his ankles. Yes, I like that, too. And then there's that great moment where he starts swatting it with the broom, and then it grabs the broom and starts swatting him. Very shades of what Raimi would do later. I like that. Yes. Yeah. Yes, most of the film is this kind of laid-back, cynical satire, and then it becomes a screwball comedy. It's true. And by the time he gets stuck in the elevator, I'm like, I'm totally on board. I love the elevator scene, because it just keeps going. Yeah. I thought it was kind of scary. Because you didn't know what it was? Because the first time I watched it, I totally found it scary, too. I guess I didn't know where it was going to go. I didn't know how dangerous it was. I didn't know if it was some, like, alien that they didn't know the powers of, or if it was just, like, a terrier. Like, it was done in a slapstick manner, mm -hmm. but I always had that edge of, yeah. like, not knowing what was going to happen, because he had real fear on his face when yeah. he was fighting it. It is interesting that this is the same guy who wrote Alien. And these are like two exact opposite sides of the coin in terms of taking the exact same concept, playing it in two completely different ways. It's true, but they both, Alien and this one, they take a situation that should be manageable, one creature, and just let it slowly get more mm -hmm. out of control, one comedically and one horrifically, and they both keep you on the edge of your seat that way. I even just, on a technical level, I love the whole elevator sequence. Because he's obviously laying on his back, but he's doing such great pantomime that he's actually, you know, suspended over a pit. <laughs> even though his hair is actually hanging back towards the wall. Oh, I didn't even notice that. That's amazing. And there's a few bits where you can see the platform that he's laying on when he's hanging from the elevator, but they sell it. They do. And I just love the comedic moments of, okay, he's stuck on the thing. The alien's bugging him. He finally pulls himself back up. Oh, the elevator's active and it's coming down. I love when it presses against his face and stops and then goes an inch further and then an inch further. <laughs> and then he's left hanging there, has to unscrew the thing, climbs up into the floor, but is stuck and then has to explode the floor in order to release himself. It was pretty great. While the elevator kicks on music. And then he does what he should have done in the first place and gets his gun. And then I love that it just pops the alien and then it's done. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Because it was a tranquilizer gun, right? Yeah. And it was a beach ball. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a very clearly plastic beach ball with feet. I think the reason why this works is that segment alone could have been a nice USC short film. Mm -hmm. You could have just taken that segment and made a nice little short film. And then they just kind of took that short film and inserted it into this film. And while structurally it kind of messes with the pace and it doesn't tonally jar with it, it's still strong enough on its own that I like watching it. It definitely didn't detract enough for me to become irritated by it, so... Yeah, yeah, I'm totally cool with it being in the film. I have no problem with movies inside movies, as long as they both have merit. Yeah. Yeah. 
And then other things they added were the original 20 minute short was just, you know, the opening bombing run. They hang around and eat food. Something goes wrong with the laser. Talby goes and investigates the whole thing with the bomb. It blows up. They're trapped in space. So, I mean, the asteroid storm was a scene that was added. The conversation between Doolittle and Talby was something that was added. Boiler with the laser gun was something that was added. The whole makeshift organ thing was something that was added. So, I mean, there was a lot of just like chapters that Mm -hmm. were inserted into this. Yeah, it does feel like a stew, but it does, it works. It's kind of almost a slice of life story, though, so it works. It's just what's a day in the life of these guys who are out beyond the fringes of anything. Doing something extraordinary, but not really caring. But they've been doing it for so long. Well, I think that's kind of, doesn't that get across? Totally. Yeah. The fact that you're like, what is this day like? It's it's nothing to them. Yeah. No matter how fantastical, no matter what interesting things they may be doing, it's so dull to them. It's not even worth mentioning. For sure. Yeah. And yet, it's also a day that has certain importances. It's the day they get Talby to come down out of the booth. It's the day where he kills the alien. It's the day where the entire ship blows up. And hey, Doolittle finally gets to be happy as a result. <laughs> a lot of finality in there. I found the whole thing kind of played like a really long music video. Yeah. I could see that. Yeah, like, you know how, like, Daft Punk does their own kind of, like, Mm -hmm. movie type things that they do the scores? It kind of felt like that. Like, it would be a music video that kept going, or maybe the beginning, and then a music video would come after it. Like a full album music video. Yeah, kind of like that. Like, it was almost like an album in a movie. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised that no one's actually said any music to that film. It seems ripe for that. Yeah. Get on that, YouTube. Because, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of nicely composed shots that, yeah, would make great music videos. Like, I just even love the um, control room that they're in, where it's just these three seats kind of staggered in opposite directions from one another, where it's like everyone has to enter the room at once and get out because there's no other way in or out of the room. Yeah, it's horrifically claustrophobic. So claustrophobic, yeah. yeah. There's just great tight angles in the corridors. There's the great shots of Talby up there in the dome. The great shot of the guy facing the bomb. I mean, you could easily, this could easily have been like a great, like, five minute music video short. Absolutely. Although I actually think I really liked the music in it. The original song aside, the score part. Yeah. I actually really enjoyed that. Yeah, I love it. It's just great gothic synth type thing. Mm -hmm. Dread and gloom, but also silliness. It was a little silly for emotionless synths. They did kind of read a little silly in some scenes, which I liked. But it had that great old, like, forbidden planet quality to it. I find yes. music like that always sets me on edge. Does it? It always makes me frightened. I love Forbidden Planet soundtrack. I think it's great, yeah. but it does definitely put you on edge. I mean, this does have like a very 50s sci-fi film feel to it through the eyes of the burned out 70s. Yeah, I would agree with that. Absolutely. It's a nice, almost, I think, unintentional deconstruction of stuff like um, Rocket Ship X1 or stuff like that. I believe one of the taglines in one of the posters for this film was just like, it's a sci-fi film for the Dr. Strangelove generation, which I think summed it up pretty well. Yeah, well, I know one of the problems was that this was actually marketed as a serious, depressing movie. Oh, really? And then people went and saw it and were just like, what the fuck is this? (laughs) And so it tanked when it first, and that's why it took like 15, 20 years to come out even on VHS. I do not doubt it tanking, yeah. And then, of course, it was controlled by the mob. Of course, yeah, well, that as well. (laughs) It has cult film written all over it. Oh, absolutely. It's one of those ones that you you could picture going to a movie theater with all the old fans and shouting quotes at the screen. Definitely. Everyone sings Benson, Arizona together. <laughs> Everyone throws cabbages at the beach ball. Bunch of pinbacks <laughs> walking around. Everyone's in jumpsuits. Yeah. Thwacking each other with brooms. Oh, man. I think you've started something. This has got to happen. Midnight movie theaters. Get on it. Yeah. Come on, guys. <laughs> Actually, you know, now I want to see it like an off-Broadway production of Dark Star, the musical. That'd be really cool. Using songs by the band Pinback? Exactly. That'd be amazing. Pinback actually uses clips from the movie in their concerts. They'll show it on the screens. Why has someone on YouTube not cut a Dark Star music video to a Pinback song? I don't know, but I'm going to search for this. Someone has had to have done it. So anything else we want to say about the movie? Because it's just, there's not a lot to it, but the way that it's all assembled just gives it this great vibe and this weird little oddity. The two things I'd like to say then are the ending is wonderful. I thought it was like an unforgettable ending. Julia, I believe, was a little nervous. She's terrified of, you want to talk about your outer space fear? Yeah, sure. All right. Okay, so. In other words, everything that's in the gravity trailer? Yeah, 
there's rational fears and then there's completely irrational fears, right? So obviously a fear of space is irrational. The chances of me getting into space are very slim considering I would never volunteer. So it would have to be some sort of situation where I was forced into space, but it could happen in the not too distant future. Anyways, all I'm saying is space is terrifying. It's a big empty void. I mean, come on. Well, I was nervous because Alex told me a little bit about the ending before we started. Something happened when I was 15. I read a short story. I'm not sure what it is. But essentially, it was about two people who are up in space, and there's an explosion, and they both become separate, like the two guys at the end of the movie are getting farther and farther and farther away from each other, and slowly over time, they're losing limbs because rocks are hitting them, and then... Kaleidoscope by Ray Bradbury. There you go, there you go, that Which one. Which I'm actually going to be bringing up in the episode here, so you, go ahead. terrified me. Like, I thought it was the most frightening concept to be alone in nothingness. It's pretty terrible. And like listening to your friends slowly fade and also being in the same position, knowing that you're going to die in nothingness. It's terrifying. I'd still take it over shark infested waters. I'll take the sharks. (laughs) Fair enough. I might as well, just to carry on that thread, you know, mention Kaleidoscope now. I was actually going to surprise everyone with it at the end of the episode, but... Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. This is actually a good place to work it in okay. because one of the problems with Alien is it very obviously swipes certain things from certain stuff that came before it. Like, Alien is pretty much the first half of the movie is Planet of the Vampires and the second half of the movie is Get the Terror from Beyond Space. Dan O'Bannon kind of has faced some hot water. He actually got sued by an author over it. And that's kind of why every other film he's done since has largely been based on a novel or something. So he has some way to say that, okay, yes, I did use a source. Dan O'Bannon is a good guy to take ideas and kind of rejigger them in interesting ways. But in his early era here, he did kind of not credit sources. Oh, that's not And good. I just read Kaleidoscope again. I remember that one from high school, too. That was a very memorable read. But I did read it again yesterday, and it, um... It's basically the last 10 minutes of Dark Star. (laughs) It's a rocket ship that's returning from the moon to Earth. It ruptures. All the astronauts are sent into space. Some of them go crazy. Some of them commit suicide. Some of them just drift away. And the last two astronauts, and yes, there is the one guy who, like, a sudden asteroid will come by and his hand is suddenly gone. So he has to crank the... the, Seal his suit back up? Yeah, he has to seal his suit back up. And then, you know, later on, his foot is suddenly gone. He has to seal his suit again. Oh, God, it's horrible. (laughs) The last two guys, the first one is actually picked up by a batch of asteroids that circle the solar system every 10 years. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. And the last guy drifts into Earth's atmosphere, cut to the ground as a little boy points at a shooting star and his mother tells him to make a wish. Yeah. Okay, because I was like, oh, well, I mean, it's sort of like, that's kind of what it is. But I mean, you could come up to that same conclusion. And then you got to the asteroids. I'm like, okay. (laughs) I mean, yeah, he did do a lot of stuff with it. But still, yeah. I have no problem with taking ideas. You just got to own up to it. Just Yeah. I'm inspired by this and you got to say it. And that's one of the problems if you watch like Alien and then you watch Planet of the Vampires and It the Terror from Beyond Space. It's just like, eh. Uh, Dan, you, you stuck a little too close. Okay, I'm going to watch those two now. I mean, Planet of the Vampires, it's they respond to an alien distress signal, go down to a planet where they find an ancient derelict alien ship complete with a giant skeleton slumped over the controls. I don't see any similarities there. <laughs> it the Terror from Beyond Space is where a single alien gets loose on board. The first person it kills is the engineer. It basically crawls around the air vents. And the way they eventually get rid of it is to literally vent all the air from the ship. That happens to everybody. Yeah. Again, this is stuff that even Dan O'Bannon was like, okay, I, from now on, I'm going to just kind of like, James Cameron had this problem too with some of his early stuff like Terminator. Had a lot of things that it borrowed from other things. I've heard about that as well. I think someone like successfully won a lawsuit against him at one point. Well, Harlan Ellison, they settled pretty quickly. All right. Fair enough. So, but I mean, it happens, but the majority of this story is pretty unique. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. It's just those last five minutes there that I'm like, but still it made for a perfect ending for this movie. (laughs) I love the ending for sure. And I think their tone must have been different from the story that you guys read. The tone is much more bleak in the story. Because as I said, the guy's losing limbs. The guy actually kills one of his fellow mates because the guy won't stop screaming over the radio. He literally punches in the guy's helmet. Yeah, it's bad. I might give that one a skip. That sounds sounds pretty. Well, if you think about it, it was over 15 years ago that I read it, and it's still, it's there. Yeah. 
Bradbury's have a habit of sticking with people. He has some very vivid stories. But yeah, it's a good story. I do recommend checking it out, especially if you're a fan of the movie. Okay. But anyways, back to Dark Star. Mm-hmm. Anything else we want to bring up about the film? Did you have something else you said you had? My last point is I would totally stay up in that cockpit and look up in <laughs> space. That was pretty sweet. The dome? I'm like, that looks amazing. I would too, but I would have the comic book with me. Yeah, I would have some reading materials and snacks. You know, nowadays they could just keep sending like, you know, here's a new fresh batch of a thousand Kindle books, you know? Exactly. They didn't really piece that together back then. That's why, like, technology is always sort of like a slightly advanced version of what was available at the time. So they were using, like, eight tracks and stuff. But now it would just be like, here's every book on Earth. Here you go in a little stick. (laughs) Oh, that was one thing that I loved was Pinback's journal, where Dan O'Bannon had actually got his hair cut and they needed to wait for his hair to grow out. So he was like, what if I film it in increments so you can see my hair grow out over the course of this diary? I really appreciated and noticed that. That was really cool. And I love how he just goes from like a sad story about how Commander Powell died to then telling dirty jokes that are getting censored out. Oh, pin back. (laughs) Nobody here appreciates me. They are uncouth. (laughs) I'm pretty sure one of those guys also had a furnace filter on his space outfit. And that was the thing. Those helmets were airtight. They couldn't breathe in those. Really? They literally had to stick a hose underneath it and then run it out the back for them to like suck in a couple of breaths, act the scene, suck in a couple of breaths, act the scene. Oh man, I would not have lasted. But I love just the obvious pie tin and like packing styrofoam. I thought that was really cool. They aren't even hiding it. It's basically just made from duct tape vinyl, the entire spacesuit. <laughs> nice. Sort of like when the band The Flaming Lips, they wanted to make their own science fiction film. So they did a science fiction Christmas film and they filmed it in a bunker outside of one of their houses. And they just mm-hmm. used all found objects. It looked really cool. There was a chunk of this film between when they stole everything from USC. And the reason why USC didn't sue them is because they thought if the film is a success, it'll be great publicity. Because Star Wars, by which I mean THX 1138, had already been a huge publicity boom for them. Mm-hmm. Then between when they took the footage and when Jack Harris came in and gave them the extra money for the reshoots, there was a chunk of this film that was literally filmed in someone's garage. Nice. And that's like all the boiler with the laser and Pinback just tanning himself. Oh, I could see that, yeah. There's really, yeah, not too much going on there. I like then the bit at the end where they're fighting over the laser and it goes off and Pinback is just like, you could have killed me. And then punches him. That was really well done. Really well shot, too. I like that. Anything else we want to bring up? My favorite part was when, um, is it Doolittle? Is that his name? I can't remember who is who, but Doolittle is... Doolittle was the commander. He was the one who was surfed in at the end. Yeah, when he talks to the bomb. That's my favorite part. Mm. I feel like the bomb was kind of like, he sounded like Wallace Shawn, the guy from My Dinner with Andre. Oh, yeah, I could see that. That was like what the conversation was like. Oh, yeah. Like My Dinner with Andre talking to this bomb and talking about how he doesn't actually know what is true and what isn't true because of what he perceives couldn't actually be what is true. A way of confusing the bomb (laughs) to make it not blow up is wonderful. I thought it was great. But then they also confused it into blowing up. Yes, because the only way was to make his own decision, which is what he did by exploding when he wanted to. I was perfectly paced, too, when he says, let there be light. Like, that was amazing. Yeah. I also think you found the perfect tagline for the movie, my dinner with Andre in space. (laughs) I even just love that last shot of Pinback of, Hey, bomb. (laughs) And I actually did like it when he went and talked to the captain that was frozen. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like talking to like a really old man that you were just looking after who was infirmed that you were trying to get answers out of. I love that he survived. Yeah. (laughs) Or quote unquote survived. Men, where are you, men? (laughs) That captain, he has all the luck. (laughs) It's true. (laughs) You got anything else, kiddo? You know, that's actually, that you mentioned that was your favorite bit. Why don't we just each take a moment to say, you know, what was our favorite bit and what was our least favorite bit? Okay. Well, that was my favorite bit. Mm -hmm. Existential talk with inanimate objects. Okay. Alex, what was your favorite? Drifting apart, conversing, and then getting picked up by the uh, asteroids and then surfing away. That was my least favorite part because the concept terrifies me. (laughs) (laughs) My favorite, and there were so many little moments, my favorite was the moment where he goes thwacking the alien with the broom, the alien grabs the broom and starts chasing him with it. Even just the way it was shot was just so Sam Raimi. I just loved how it was put together. So, Julia, you said that was your least favorite? Yeah. Was the space bit. Alex, what was your least favorite? I'm trying to think of what my least favorite was. I might say the beginning of Pinback versus the alien before I kind of got on board with what was going on. I would say I was kind of, that would probably be my least favorite. And mine... Whew trying to think 
Uh, I actually don't know. <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah, there's a film where I just, I kind of like a lot of it, but it's, um, hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, it's because I didn't go in thinking that I would have to have an answer for this, so probably got one somewhere. Oh, if you think of anything. You don't have to dislike any part of the movie. Uh, I can't think of one at the moment. This is just a film that's right up my alley. It's just kind of everything, and it just feels like it's for me. It feels like one of those late-night science fiction films. It's really relaxing, but also involving at the same time. I really appreciated it. I find that um, when movies are set in space, Mm -hmm. they're allowed to have a slower pace. Yeah. It's almost like you allow it to go slower, because it's almost like you imagine what space would be like. That time, that your day, that everything would just move slower for some reason. I would agree with that, absolutely. You could take time to, like, all the surroundings and everything. Just look around, because it's all really... Maybe because there's no sunrise and sunset. There's no passage of time like there is here, especially if they're looking at being 20 years gone and only three years in real life or a mix of time and not it actually existing. I actually thought of my least favorite. Yay! It's uh, Talby when he's when the laser activates and he's still trying to fix it. And then there's the whole bit of where it goes, warning, do not break the laser just as he breaks the laser. Oh. It was just kind of a forced moment. It just felt like it was something there for the, to be there. Yeah, it didn't really have too much of a point because I was trying to figure out exactly what significance this had, although it did lead to the hilarious moment of him going out the airlock. And then a couple of the scenes where it's just the three of them together in a room, relaxing, can drag a little bit, but there were still bits that I enjoyed, like the bit where they're having the meal. It drags a bit, but there's still some great little jokes in there. And the bit where they're all just sitting around in their sleeping quarters, it has the benefit of Pinback failing to cheer everyone up with his practical jokes. Yes. <laughs> I like the part where they were eating just because I like anything to do with food. So space food is fascinating. Even though they were drinking like freezies, essentially. Absolutely. And those were literally freezies that they didn't even change the pack to wrapping up. <laughs> They're like, all right, pork, but it's purple and blue. Yeah. yeah. That's what I love was, oh, God, I hope it's not chicken again. Chicken, close it again. Oh, ham. <laughs> <laughs> the night is saved. So final thoughts. I think we all kind of recommend it. I think we're all pro Dark Star. Yeah. Yeah. Team Dark Star right here. For our first feature film of the podcast, I think it's a good recommend all around. Yep. Very promising. We're off to a, a rousing start. I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. I don't know that it's a film for everybody. Definitely not. <laughs> no. I would not rec- I would only recommend it to certain people. I know the people I would recommend it to and the people I would not even mention it. <laughs> yeah. Just some people just not into that kind of thing. No. A lot of people don't have patience. No. Or dare I say it, imagination. <laughs> Love them the way they <laughs> Not any names. <laughs> it's a good proto Red Dwarf. I could see that. I was thinking about that because I'm I'm not too familiar with a lot of the space comedies like Red Dwarf, but I'm like, this has got to be along the lines. Red Dwarf is a little more chipper, but it is. It's literally three people lost in space a million years after all of humanity has died. So it's just them by themselves over and over and over again. I could totally see that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little more sitcom shenanigan heavy, but yeah. It's got that dark British sensibility. Yes. Have you seen it? No, I'm used to. A couple episodes, but not long enough to be able to talk about it properly. Fair enough. They've got the entire series here on American Netflix. I don't know if it's on Canadian Netflix. We have nothing. Ah. Netflix is as empty as space. (laughs) (laughs) So, should I take a moment just to talk about the novelization by Alan Dean Foster? Please do. It was his second novelization. The first one was for Luana the Jungle Girl, which was a film that actually was never finished and never released, but the publisher liked his adaptation so much that they published it anyways. He literally started with a novelization of a film that doesn't exist. That's pretty cool. And this was his second one, and he was already a pretty well-established original science fiction and fantasy author, and I... I'm conflicted. I like Alan Dean Foster a lot. I love his original novels. He's kind of known as the king of novelizations, especially during the 80s and 70s, but only I think half of them work because he has a very specific writing style that doesn't fit every script he's given. Like, he's really great with Clash of the Titans and the original Star Wars and Crawl and Last Starfighter, but with stuff like Alien and The Thing, they kind of fall flat and are a bit dull, and Dark Star has a bit of that problem, too. The biggest problem with Dark Star is that in his quest to flesh it out as a novel, instead of like really getting into it and kind of like exploring the characters' backstories, exploring some of their past missions and everything, he instead decided to approach it as hard science fiction and try to scientifically explain how everything would actually work factually. And that doesn't work when you're talking about a goofy, silly movie where things aren't supposed to be realistic. I was saying that would not appeal to me. (laughs) 
And in his quest to explain the jokes, he kills the jokes. <clears throat> Alan Dean Foster is not without a sense of humor. He has this kind of nice little sly, whimsical wit that doesn't fit the goofiness of Dark Star. So, I mean, that entire stretch with Pinback and the alien beach ball He's like spending pages trying to explain the inner anatomy of the beach ball and how a creature like that could actually exist. He's so embarrassed that he has to call the asteroid storm an asteroid storm that he actually has the computer get into an argument about whether or not that's a factual thing to call it. The worst sin, though, is with Talby and the Phoenix asteroids, is him just suggesting that that's Talby's death hallucination as he runs out of oxygen. Oh, no. And it's like, no, don't take that moment from Talby. Yeah, let him be in the asteroids. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Alan D. Foster, his prose is very strong. It just does not fit this material at all. No, that doesn't sound like it does. By killing a lot of the humor, it becomes this really dull and sad study of these broken, lost men. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, it's not fun. It's not funny. He somehow turned Boiler into, like, a hateful bigot who calls everyone fags. Oh my god. Yeah, and it's like, where did that come from? <laughs> it's not a good book. And so anyone who's a fan of this, I don't recommend it. I'm kind of curious, though, just to see how it could all go wrong. It sounds like taking everything you love about a movie and flipping it into something. He took it so seriously and approached it with so much passion that he completely missed the point. All right. Well, <laughs> that's pretty crazy. I mean, the one thing that I like is that as Doolittle is surfing into the atmosphere, he finally remembers what his first name is. Oh, really? But then the book suggests that he's just thinking of something else. Oh. And it's like, Alan. Commit. I mean, like, he even feels the need to explain what Pinback's daily fitness routine is just to explain why he can hang from the bottom of the elevator for as long as he does. I have that note, by the way, that he has fantastic upper body strength. <laughs> yes, and they have that he was a, uh, a high school league chin-up champion. I actually appreciate that. <laughs> Not so specific as chin-up champion. <laughs> but he takes half a page to then detail it <laughs> instead of just having it be a throwaway, you know? Chin-ups finally paid off. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's just, it's, it, I wouldn't even recommend it for fans of Alan Dean Foster. He's just the wrong material for him and his style. So that's the novelization. We already covered Kaleidoscope, which I was going to bring up around here. So I don't really have anything else to bring up. Anything you guys want to add? I want to know what we're doing next. Next is Carpenter's actual full-length theatrical debut that was made from the beginning as a full-length theatrical debut, Assault on Precinct 13. Yay! I've I'm seen a... the remake. Yeah, have you? Yeah. I've also seen the remake. I haven't seen the original in a long time. I love how you guys have already seen the one I've already covered on my own podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even remember what happens in the remake. I just remember Maria Bello. It's so a we... very, very, very different story than what happens in the original. But I mean, I don't say that as a criticism. I actually kind of like the remake. But it's a very, very, very different story. But we'll discuss that one next month. Absolutely. When we return on Masters of Carpentry. Stay tuned for the next exciting episode. Be there. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Masters of Carpentry is a Made of Fail production. Made of Fail dot net. We were unpopular before it was cool. Do you want to try and do like a little summary first of Dark Star? I actually did manage to script one. So do you? Okay. Well, we can go with that then. Okay. It's very hard to summarize this film. It's both simple and complex at the same time. I managed to get it done in three paragraphs. That's good. That's real good. And I like my Bloody Valentine 3D, but not for the right reasons. We had a good Absolutely. time watching it in theater. It's not a good movie by any stretch of the And I don't know if you remember the remakes episode. I love the original. And so... Yes, yes. So I literally took a clip of Spoonie yelling betrayal and put it in the beginning of 3D. <laughs> but there's 3D boobies. There is 3D boobies, it's true. 3D boobies. There was 3D boobies in Piranha. You hated that. Those things being ripped off by piranhas and it was a traumatic experience. You know, there's actual 3D porn people can get online, so we don't need to see it in the middle of a bad horror movie. Well, I didn't know, so it was exciting. <laughs> That's true. <Yeah. laughs>